We're here today for a double purpose, and, uh, but I want to preface it by thanking all of you who uh, helped us on the campaign, helped us get, uh, get us on the ballot uh, here in Washington State. We're here because we're, we're trying out a new formula. You know, we always try to do things in an innovative way and turn adversity into a plus. <laughs> the Democrats filed 21 phony lawsuits in 18 states to get us off the ballot, Nader Camejo. They did it with harassment, intimidation on the streets. They went to people's homes who collected signatures and warned them that if there were any faulty signatures, they could go to jail in order to chill them. They hired corporate Republican firms like Ken Starr's firm, Kirkland Ellis, uh, the firms that we've been fighting for 40 years. And they had an unholy alliance with these corporate Republican firms who threw dozens and dozens of lawyers and uh, paralegals to get us off the ballot in Pennsylvania, off the ballot in Ohio, and many other states. This, of course, uh, drained us uh, of time and energy. And we had very little time uh, to recover, and it cost us a million dollars just to try to fight these. Now, I'm confronting this, and I'm saying to myself, hey, this is a great opportunity. Why is it a great opportunity? Because in the citizen movement, you've got to learn to turn a loss into a win. And what we came out of 2004, among many other achievements of bringing young, young generation into politics, of coast to coast in 50 states, hammering away at the progressive agenda, and politics as if people matter instead of corporate domination. We also, because of this struggle with the Democrats, have documented beyond the wildest dreams of political scientists just how powerful these ballot access laws are to destroy competition to the two parties. These ballot access laws, which both parties help pass in state legislature after state legislature, erect barriers against third party and independent candidates at the uh, local, state, and national level that are unheard of in other Western countries. Unheard of. We have 50 different state ballot access standards for federal elections when we should have just one standard, federal standard for people running for Congress and for the president. And so we have this situation where you can get on the ballot as a presidential candidate in Tennessee with 300 signatures, and next door, it's 100,000 signatures in North Carolina. Now, you can talk a lot about these ballot access laws and the, the debate exclusions and the various county harassments, and there are rules in the county, and and how they throw away write-in votes and so on. But when you actually provoke the Democrats, when you put them under pressure, the mucus and the pus <laughs> and the fangs all come out. And it's quite a difference at levels of documentation. And one of the most astounding discoveries that our campaign provoked was that the Democrats do not consider ballot access laws and obstructive tactics denying people the opportunity to vote for candidates of their choice by getting these candidates off the ballot. They don't consider that a civil liberties issue. They don't consider it a free speech issue. They don't consider it a freedom of assembly issue. And of course, it's the consummate freedom of speech and freedom of assembly, running for elective office. And that includes liberals who will go around saying they'll fight to the end to defend the right of Newt Gingrich and Rush Limbaugh to speak freely. You know that approach. But they will fight to the end to obstruct people who agree with them and are willing to go into state after state to champion their causes and they'll violate their civil liberties, freedom of speech. Now why? 
is not just hypocritical. It's that they are willing prisoners of a 215-year-old electoral college, winner-take-all, two-party electoral dictatorship. And, and, it, and as I told them, it's time to break out of jail. This can go on forever. Every four years, there will be a winner-take-all. Every four years, there will be an electoral college. Every four years, there will be a least worst. And the least worst attitude has no end logic. Once you stick your mind to a least worst mindset, some things happen automatically. First, your vote will be taken for granted, and the least worst candidate will not look back, and you will, you will by virtue of the least worst attitude, make no demands on that candidate, because you don't want to upset the possibility that the least worst will win over the worst. That frees the candidate to play ball with the corporate interests who make demands 24 hours a day. They're not squeamish. They make demands on all these candidates. And so if you look at it like a tug of war, the least worst attitude gives the, in this case, Carrie Edwards, a free ride, tells Carrie Edwards, you can forget about losing our votes because we despise Bush so much that you've got our vote. Carte blanche. And then, of course, three things kick in. The corporate interests pull without the liberals pulling in the opposite way, like on living wage, like on criminal justice reform, <clears throat> like on pension protection, like on worker standards, like on corporate globalization, like on environment, like on peace, on and on. Check out the websites for all those groups. Not one of them made a demand. Not the FLCIO, not the civil rights groups, not the environment groups like Sierra Club. None of them made any demands on Kerry to pull him in their direction, where presumably he would get more votes, unless they're ashamed of what they're doing six days a week. Like living wage, 47 million workers making five fifteen an hour to under $10 an hour. That's a good issue. But labor didn't pull it. Instead, no, corporations pull the least worst in their direction, number one. Number two, the least worst candidate feels free, because he's got all these votes in the bag, to engage in protective imitation to get another 3 4% from the Republicans. And what that does, of course, is compromise the agenda of the liberals. For example, no challenge of the bloated, corrupt, wasteful military budget by the liberals in this campaign. Half of your government's federal expenditures, operating expenditures, half of your tax dollars that go to Washington for operating expenditures, not Social Security, go into military budgets, wasn't even an issue. The third is that the least worst falls into the trap of blurring the difference between his candidacy and the worst. Very few bright lines between Kerry and Bush were discernible or even recollected. Because the strategy was take the Iraq issue off the table by out hawking Bush in the first presidential debate to the delight of William Sapphire. The strategy was take the Israeli-Palestinian issue off the table by mimicking Bush. The strategy was don't raise the issue of all that enormous waste and corruption in the military contracting budgets. Be like Bush. Ask for more. The strategy was don't upset your fundraisers from the corporate world by taking a direct challenge to corporate subsidies, handouts, giveaways, and bailouts 
which accrue to almost every major corporation in the country today. The strategy was, don't talk about poverty, because the Republicans will call you tear-jerking liberals. They'll, they'll start recollecting all those welfare days. They'll stereotype you. Don't talk about a third of America. They can't make it on what they earn. Household incomes going down under Bush. Poverty going up. Child poverty going up. Unemployment going up. Underemployment going up. Lack of health care coverage going up. And the, and the Democrats don't make an issue of this? That's what the least worst does. But the other thing it does is it closes the brain down to further thought. You've experienced this. You can't, you can't raise any alternative strategies and tactics to defeat Bush. Because the mantra of the least worster is anybody at Bush, leave Kerry alone, make no demands on him, and what did they get? Bush. <laughs> Bye. To put it in, an, in a short sentence, by not making Kerry better, they allowed him to become worse. They allowed him to be viewed as flip-flopping, wishy-washy, on the one hand, on the other, ambiguous and engaged in protective imitation of Bush, which is a prescription for defeat. How many times have you heard people say in the, over the years, you know, I really don't like Reagan, but I have to admire that he sticks to his position, even though it's devastating to the world, right, <laughs> and to the workers. What do you mean you have to admire him? You know, it's like saying, you know, I, I don't like Goebbels, but I have to admit, he does his work brilliantly. <laughs> there are people who admire some politicians who just take a stand no matter where they stand. And by virtue, and, and the converse is true, they can't stand flip-floppers. They can't stand flip-floppers. Now, to be fair to Kerry, he was tired as a flip-flopper and was unable to explain why he flip-flopped. You remember, I voted for the $87 billion for the Iraq War, and then I voted against it, whatever. In the Senate, you have to do that all the time because you may not like the way the bill is being funded. He wanted, for example, Iraq oil to pay for more of that. Uh, there are all kinds of riders and things that would make you defeat or vote to defeat the main bill. But he wasn't able to get that across. He was, he was too busy catching up with the swift vote, vote people. <laughs> now, why do I dwell on this? Because this is going to continue. After the election, the Democrats did not look at themselves in the mirror, with few exceptions. They still said, well, we came close, for heaven's sake, 70,000 swing votes in Ohio, and they'd be talking about the failed Karl Rove. So because they came close instead of landsliding Bush, which is really what they should have done, not just beat him. He has such a horrible record. They should have landslided him and taken the Congress. Because of that, they're making excuses for themselves that warrant no fundamental change in what they're doing and no replacement of the people who failed. Except for Howard Dean, there is no insurgent movement to replace the Democrats who have been losing for 10 years to the worst of the Republicans at the local, state, and national level. I mean, they would get better advice from a football coach. <laughs> and that's when you know that it's going to happen again, and it's going to happen again. And because the Democrats have this practice of abandoning whole states from presidential elections, they, lo they lower the vote for the Democrats in states like Georgia and Alabama all the way down to city council. You travel in the South, the Democrats are very bitter what's left of them. 
because year after year, there's no campaign at the national level, and of course, the Democrats lose governorships, legislatures, and mayors. So what you can reasonably predict in the future is more of the same, more losing ground in Congress. How can you abandon the red states and expect to win six Senate seats in the South that were once Democratic until this month? How can you, how can you keep Kerry and Edwards and all the machine politics and all the ads out of Georgia and South Carolina and North Carolina and expect to win the, the seat that Edwards had to vacate or the seat that Hollings had to vacate? They lost them all. Now, why is this important for people of our persuasion? Because what it tells us is, one, that the Democratic Party is incapable of internal reform. It took me 20 years to realize this, so <laughs> take your time. <laughs> uh, you know, we would all try. It's not, because after every defeat, the same people are in charge. The same corporate consultants, the same corporate financiers around Kerry. If you look at Kerry's inner circle when he set up his campaign, there was no prominent African-American leader. There was no prominent Hispanic-American leader. There was no prominent environmental leader. There was no prominent labor leader. There was no prom prominent peace advocate. There was no prominent corporate reformer. Only corporate types like Robert Rubin, Wall Street. That's, that's the sign. There are certain signs that, are, that give you an air of predictability early in the campaign. So where does that leave us? But what we have to do is, first of all, recognize what enormous advance in people power can accrue if we stopped exaggerating the amount of civic energy that's needed. Have you ever heard that one before? All right. One million Americans distributed throughout the United States giving 200 hours volunteer time a year, raising or contributing $100 a year, Focusing with laser beam intensity on Congress with four or five high profile issues like living wage, the war, so on. You cannot believe the change that will occur. Why? Because from members of Congress' point of view, with their safe seats, there's nothing out there. They don't lose a day's sleep about any rumble from their district. Nixon was so afraid of the rumble of the people in the late 60s and early 70s that he went berserk signing progressive legislation. <laughs> he signed the Environmental Protection Act, the Occupational Safety and Health Act, the Product Safety Commission Act. He sent a health insurance bill to Congress that was better than Clinton's. He wanted to give voting rights to the people of the District of Columbia. He sent a bill to Congress for rehabilitation of nonviolent drug offenders instead of incarceration. Now, you think he believed in all this? He heard the rumble of the people. Nixon was terrified of liberals. Bush is contemptuous of liberals. He sneers at liberals. Now, who do you think bears that responsibility? The liberals. Because what they did was they allowed their party to be dragged into the grip of the corporate interests and allowed their party to remove from the political elect electoral table the basic fundamental issues of livelihood that won again and again for the Democrats under FDR and Truman. And when you create a vacuum, because you take off 
the table. The corporate exploitation that goes right down to people's housing, to people's nutrition, to people's public work services, to people's safety, to people's environment. When you take that off the table, when you take off the table a living wage, when you take off the table all these issues that are perceived to be important by the people, not some think tanks, in Russia's the social religious issues, desecration of the flag, prayer in schools, abortion, gay rights. Are they unimportant? Of course not. But they're not all important. And the Democrats allowed them, allowed the Republicans to, to make them all important with their vicious distortion and bigotry. That's the problem. We have the we have the militarization of our society right from here all the way to Iraq and around the world. We have corporate globalization undermining our democratic processes, as the people in the streets in Seattle demonstrated in 1999. We have, we have, we have, we have a declining standard of living for millions of American workers. A majority of them make less today than 1973 in inflation-adjusted wages. We have devastation of our environment, of our land, our water, our air, poisoned by these corporations. That's the word for it. Despoiled, made uninhabitable, and poisoned. And what do we do? Have you ever tried to knot your shoelaces loosely? Have you ever deliberately tried to do it loosely? It doesn't last very long, does it? Huh? But, it but it's a good shoelace, isn't it? But it has to be tied tightly. That's what we fail to do in citizen organization. It's too scattered. It's too intermittent. And it's not sufficiently focused on the Khyber Pass of politics in America which is the Congress. Congress is made up of 535 people, men and women, who did exactly what you did this morning. They got up, they went to the bathroom, they put on their clothes, they ate some breakfast, and they decided what they were going to do. 1,500 corporations control the majority of those people. And we're 200 million Americans. Consider that. Can't three million Americans organized in Congress Watch locals, or even a million of them, in congressional districts take over Congress? If they represent values, policies, and programs, and perceived needs and necessities of tens of millions of other people, like on health care? Of course they can. But first, They've got to realize that there's a quantitative goal to be met, and everyone has to play their part. That's why these clipboards are being circulated. We will protect your privacy. We want you to expand our email list. One million Americans, 200 volunteer hours a year. That's four hours a week. A couple reality shows and $100 each, $100 million. How many of you think that's a worthwhile effort? It's also a life-fulfilling effort. There's no greater gratification than justice. You know that. There's no, gratifica there's no gratification greater than working with your fellow neighbors, workers, relatives, to make a better society. Those of you who have made progress here in Seattle, when you prevail on something, you resurrect, you renovate, you initiate something, it's tremendous. We have to realize that a society whose population spends the bulk of their waking hours looking at screens is a society that is going to be dominated by screens. TV screens, video screens, computer screens. 
Interpersonal activity is now at an all-time low in the civic community. It is harder than ever to get people out to rallies, marches, city council. You have to beg them. You've had that experience? You beg people to save themselves. Please give an hour of your time. Don't you know that half a democracy is just showing up? We're reaping the failure of our educational system, where we don't study practical civics. We don't study how to practice democracy. That doesn't mean we can't change that in our curriculum if we really bear down on our public schools. So we ready a next generation that can stand tall? In many ways, we have to think anew in this kind of milieu. Because the last civic innovation was when? Does anybody remember it? Is anybody here 100 years old? <laughs> Do you know the abolition movement for slavery in England pioneered most of the civic initiatives, uh, strategies that we're still clinging to today? Contacting their parliaments, demonstrating, petitioning. It's time to take it to another level, isn't it? Especially with the internet. Isn't it time to take it for, to another level in terms of everybody saying to themselves, I'm going to have a breakthrough innovation in civic action. I'm going to find a way that's going to push this forward. That's going to motivate people. That's going to develop strategic priorities. That's going to Stop the people who do all the talking and don't do any work from mo monopolizing citizen and community neighborhood meetings. The people who do the work should run the organization, not the people who do the talk. How many of those have you gone through? <laughs> talk, 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 and you give them an assignment and they, have, they don't have the time. <laughs> now here we come with Iraq. It seems like an impossible task. We have a renegade messianic militarist in the White House. A man who has never admitted a mistake other than an occasional wrong appointment, unnamed. That's as far as he's gotten. Oh, and he uses words that Laura chides him about, like smoke him out. A president who never makes, who never admits to making a mistake is a president who is the biggest mistake of all. <laughs> but it shows you what we're dealing with. Now, in last June, I wrote Bush a letter, among many letters. <laughs> and I said, you are lowballing U.S. casualties in Iraq, never mind Iraqi casualties. They wouldn't even bother counting them. There's over 100,000 dead, according to Johns Hopkins, on the site sample survey in Iraq three months ago. Much worse now. Your government does not have the decent respect for the families of our military personnel to disclose the full range of injury, disease, and mental trauma. Because all that they disclose are fatalities, except for suicides and contractor employee deaths, and injuries in the pitch of battle. Well, that leaves out thousands of injuries, paraplegic, quadriplegic, very serious injuries, in the process over there, Humvees, turning over, etc. Instead of 8,000 injuries, there are over 30,000. Mental trauma, severe enough for evacuation from Iraq. Thousands of cases. You know, you, you see the bravado of the troops. What do you think happens to someone who looks at a car with a mother, father, and three-year-old girl passing by, and it didn't stop because they were told to stop, 
Well, maybe they didn't hear. And instead of shooting out the tires, they killed the mother and father. And the little girl with blood drew, drew, coming on her face was shown in the New York Times last week. What do you think of the soldiers who go through that? They're not all, you know, hard-boiled. That's where the mental trauma is coming from. Now, we have a Bush administration that will not level with the American people on the full range of U.S. casualties because it doesn't want an increased opposition to this illegal fabricated war. This war is a war crime. It is a war crime. <laughs> it is a war crime from the legal standard. One, it was not constitutionally authorized. Only Congress can declare war. That is not a technicality in our Constitution. That is a requirement. It was considered by the Founding Fathers one of the most important requirements. They did not want one person in the White House to send our nation to war. Unconstitutional, one. Second, it violated international law and treaties to which we are signatory, including the UN Charter. You do not attack a nation that poses no threat to you. The war was based on a platform of fabrications, deceptions, lies, and fulminations from the White House day after day on television, as we recall. There are no weapons of mass destruction. Bush spent a billion of your tax dollars after the invasion, desperately seeking some container, some canister, some mobile vehicle with some residue of the biological and chemical materials that Reagan and Bush one sold to Saddam Hussein in the 1980s because he was our brutal dictator against the Iranians and the Ayatollahs. On the other side of the world, there is a fearful threat of an influenza epidemic out of China and Thailand already has claimed a few dozen lives. The fear is that the avian flu will jump a barrier and mutate with a human virus and create a virulent, deadly influenza of the kind that took 40 million lives in 1919, a million in this country. One billion dollars and 1,500 U.S. inspectors in Iraq to try to salvage Bush's reputation or credibility on this issue, and they all came back and said nothing, nothing. Hand-picked arms inspectors by Bush, nothing. And 20 infectious disease specialists working with the Chinese government authorities to try to head off a deadly influenza epidemic that you may have been reading about in the New York Times and other newspapers. This is the definition of institutional insanity. So it's illegal, an illegal, unconstitutional war. Now, when a war is a war crime, every death and every injury in that war is a war crime. And he has now implicated thousands of Americans in his war criminal activity. And he has the effrontery a few days ago of standing in front of the U.S. Capitol and giving a 21-minute address for his inauguration on liberty, freedom, and democracy. We have to get out of that war. This is the first war we've been plunged into against the considered judgment of retired military, diplomatic, and intelligence officials. And not a few in the government itself. The war was opposed by the U.S. Army in the Pentagon up to the four-star level, just below Myers, General Myers, because they knew what they were getting into. 
You cannot defeat a popularly supported insurgency whose principal appeal is to get the occupier out of their country. Cannot be defeated. Without doing what one caller to C-SPAN recommended the other day, which is to nuke them all. If we want to distance the mainstream Iraqis from participating and supporting the insurgency, shopkeeper by day, guerrilla by night, the only way to do that is with a dead set timetable to pull out our U.S. military and corporate oil company forces from Iraq within a six-month period. <clears throat> <clears throat> Why six-month period, other than they couldn't get out logistically in that period? Because we owe a responsibility to the Iraqi people, and it goes back a long way. We helped entrench Saddam Hussein. He was an anti-communist dictator. That was our favorite dictator all over the world, right? We equipped him with arms, financial credit, intelligence, goaded him to invade Iran. Take a slice of that country, southwest portion. Gave them cover. Sold them weapons of mass destruction, material, U.S. corporations under Department of Commerce license. Then he, he, he was so taken by our support, he thought he could take over Kuwait. He's not the smartest of guys. And, of course, then he became our enemy. Pushing them back out of Kuwait, the UN-US sanctions killed 500,000 children, rough give or take, according to the Distinguished Physicians Task Force from this country that went to Iraq repeatedly. You might have seen Leslie Stahl's piece on 60 Minutes. It was done not just by curtailing <coughs> medicines and other life-saving equipment, like child catheter was on the dual list, prohibi prohibitive list, uh, on the grounds that it could be melted down and used for some warlike instrument. Child catheter. But it was the prohibition of exporting chlorine to decontaminate water that was the big, gigantic killer for young children and infants with diarrhea and dysentery. You don't think the Iraqis know this? They say, oh, we say, well, it's, it's Saddam's fault. Well, since when are you relying on Saddam to save kids? I thought he's a, one of the worst brutal dictators in the modern world. And suddenly you say, it was up to him? It was up to us not to violate international law, which requires any embargo not to inflict deadly harm on innocent civilians in the country that's the subject of the embargo. And then, of course, in 1998, the bombing increased. There was a mini attack on Iraq. And that's when Clinton and Gore passed through Congress a resolution saying it was American foreign policy to move to regime change in Iraq, a point that Bush pointed out repeatedly as he moved to regime change in Iraq. So we owe them a responsibility. And that's why we can't just zing out of there. Why we have to, in the six or so months, have real internationally supervised elections with suitable autonomies for the three groups, Sunni, Shiite, Kurd. With an end game timetable, we will be able to bring in peacekeepers from Islamic countries nearby and neutral countries that are used to that kind of international effort, because they know it's a short-term thing, and they are not supporting a permanent U.S. occupation with 14 military bases a building and a permanent takeover of their oil resources by Texas oil companies and continue humanitarian aid. All of this will cost a lot less on every index. Casualties, dollars, international reputation, 
or becoming a recruiting ground for more terrorists. How do we achieve something like this? <clears throat> All over the country, there's going to be an increased acceleration demanding a withdrawal policy from Iraq. An end to the war and occupation is another way to put it. After taking a year off, a lot of these groups are swinging back into action. But it's going to take more than demonstrations, however decentralized and impressive they are. And there will be demonstrations. It's going to take <coughs> tens of thousands of veterans and retired military intelligence and diplomatic people who are already against this, who are already warned against this, but who haven't, haven't tied that shoelace tight enough, who haven't integrated their mobilization and focused it on the ultimate decision makers, George W. Bush and the Congress. Veterans for Peace how many people have heard of Veterans for Peace? This is growing by leaps and bounds. It's veteransforpeace.org. You know, I'll look into it. Veteransforpeace.org. It's out of St. Louis. I spoke to their convention in Boston last year. These are World War II, Korean, Vietnam, Gulf War, and Iraq War veterans. For the swing opinion in this country, Military, intelligence, diplomatic, and veterans are the credible group. And they have to be mobilized, as they're mobilizing themselves. But you know, Human Rights Watch just got 10 major retired generals and admirals to sign a letter to the Congress opposing Gonzalez's nomination because his civilian lawyers in the Justice Department <laughs> overrode military law and international law and the Geneva Conventions. And it's really show you how bad things are in this country. Is it was the military lawyers that stood tall against the corruption of the civilian lawyers in the Justice Department and the White House. And this is what needs to be put forward. The human face of the civilian tragedies there have to be conveyed again and again and again with photographs and testimonials and documentation. The cost will be apparent to you in a new way in about a week or two. Wait until you see the domestic budget of George W. Bush. He can't expand the deficit anymore, which I call a tax on babies, because they're the ones who are going to have to pay for it. If the Democrats had any brains, they would call his deficit a tax on our children and grandchildren, not a tax reduction only for the wealthy. He, he, financed, he financed the tax cut for the wealthy by going into a half a trillion dollar deficit every year. So he's run out of that. The boys in Wall Street have given him the caution signal. You can't go any deeper in the red. The dollar may collapse, etc. So now he's going to do it by cutting your budgets. Name them. Name the budgets that are nourished by federal dollars in Seattle and watch the cuts. And they're all going to come out except for Homeland Security and the defense budget. They're pretty much off limits, give or take a weapon system that was designed for the Soviet Union. They may cut those down. If you could know, and believe me, there are people in Washington who still haven't, it hasn't sunk in. If you realize how this corporate, military, industrial, federal budget is shaped, and what it does to the dollars you have withheld every day when you go to work, you wouldn't wait for the next flight to Washington. The F-22 is a plane designed for the Soviet era of hostility. It started out at $25 million a plane. Those of you who know about World War II planes, how many know about the P-38? You know what that was going for? $38,000. 
you know, even adjust for inflation. The F-22 is now, there's a dispute. It's either $150 or $230 million a piece. It hasn't been produced yet for operational purposes. They lost one crash, just, you know, another $150 million here and there. That's four times what the United States spent on malaria research. One crash. I think it was in Nevada. Pilots, I think, bailed out. It was an experiment. You know, it wasn't quite finished yet. The plane was not quite finished yet. <clears throat> so what do we come down to? Let me know what we come down to. There's a real analytic tool here if you want to motivate people. It's called the sensuality ladder. The sensuality ladder is where you get closer and closer to people's senses and sense of right and wrong. So you can talk about nutrition on a general basis, but if you talk about dirty meat, with rat feces in the hot dogs, this is a different reaction, right? <laughs> That's going down the sensuality ladder. <laughs> you can talk about the billions of dollars wasted in the Pentagon budget, but when you talk about a $435 claw hammer that you can get for 12 bucks in the hardware store, that really hits home. As a matter of fact, people in the Pentagon have told me, no other fact about the Pentagon budget produced such a resistance and outrage. By the way, you know what they called it? You know what the companies called it who sold this little claw hammer for $435? I had to look into it because I couldn't for the life of me see anybody in the Pentagon writing, off, writing a check for $435 for a claw hammer. And it turned out they called it a unilateral impact generator. Sounds fancy. <laughs> so what we have to ask ourselves is, what gets your friends and neighbors angry about injustice? At what level do they finally become angry? Socially indignant, to put a phrase on it. That leads to action. You notice they mobilized against desegregation in places around the country, you know, busing. That was low on the sensuality ladder, wasn't it? They were their kids. So what we have to do is bring these issues that people in a general way feel uncomfortable about happening in our country and bring it down to the sensuality ladder. And in that sense, we have to ask people the following question. If you don't want power, we're not interested in you. If you don't want to be a leader, we're not interested in you. If you don't want to dedicate some of your resources to expanding this great movement of democracy as if people mattered first, not corporations, we're not interested in you. We have to become stringent with one another at a level that is a fraction of what we do on the sports teams. Huh? Do we allow any slackers on our team? You know how people talk to one another? Right down to the bowling league. <laughs> Never mind the poker playing. That doesn't mean we have to be nasty. It means we have to convey the difference between overall concern for injustice and being really serious about it. That's what we have to do. Now, we are trying to wind down this campaign not by sitting in Washington in backdoor fundraising with fat cats or cutting deals on tort issues or whatever, but by going around the country and getting these contributions from people who are serious and getting a mobilization to get out of that quagmire war in Iraq. And at the same time, and at the same time, bringing together the names, addresses, email lists of more and more people who are serious, who want to reach that critical mass of one million, to demonstrate 
that it doesn't take dropping out of your entire life's routine and throwing everything you have on the struggle for justice. If we do it in a very smart, strategic way, and we put the pressure on the key Kyber Pass, which is Congress, and we do it in a way where we can be continually gratified and encouraged to continue expanding our efforts. Now, in a way, we're, we're trying to make history, aren't we? In a way, we're trying to at least achieve the breakthroughs that our forebears achieved at signal in, uh, junctures of American history. And you know them. I've said them a hundred times. The exit for jo King George III, the abolition of slavery, women's right to vote, the struggle for labor, the struggle for farmers, all the way into this century and all the struggles you know about. Just think of the formidable odds there. In one year, the whole picture about Iraq can be changed. Today's Seattle Times, if those of you saw it, has the following stunning headline for those who haven't been closely following it. This is the most powerful army in the history of the world, Army, Air Force, Navy. The firepower against those insurgents is 1,000 to 1 or 10,000 to 1. Here's the headline. U.S. losing ground war in Iraq. What does that tell you? See? That tells you that if anyone tried to do to us, anyone tried to occupy us with 10,000 times firepower from some foreign power who liked our resources, who would you bet on? Yeah, I think even Texans alone would take care of them. <laughs> Why? Because they are fighting for everything that they care about, whether we agree with them or not. And they know that we're fighting there because of a war criminal in the White House called George W. Bush. Uh, I just want to convey the latent opposition to this war uh, that can be brought to the forefront. You know, for every Marine general retired like Anthony Zinni, there are dozens. For every admiral spoken out like Shanahan, there are dozens. The security chief for George Bush the first, Scowcroft, has been constantly speaking out in the way he can against this. There's a huge number of powerful people that can be galvanized and networked more and more. And the more they see the swell of the public, the more encouraged they are to step forward. And now a majority of the people in poll after poll say it was a mistake to send the troops to Iraq. And that majority is increasing. And on other questions they're asked, increasingly the tide is turning against Bush. And the Republicans who say, well, then how come Bush won it's because there really wasn't a referendum on the war, because the Democrats didn't make it that. So take heart from all this. I recall when we were trying to stop the war from starting in the last three weeks, 13 groups wrote letters, personal letters to Bush, asking for a few minutes of his time. He has never met with an anti-war group, by the way, not once. Closed mind. These groups are veteran groups, intelligence officials, National Council of Churches, uh, students, women's for peace, labor groups, business group. Each one of them wrote a letter. Not one answer, even a courtesy reply. Now, could a dictator have done worse? And here's the nub. Here is the most humiliating situation, which we should not t tolerate. Saddam Hussein said there were no weapons of mass destruction. Bush said there were. Saddam Hussein 
judging by the number of people he's killed in Iraq and extrapolating out year by year, would have killed fewer people than the Iraqi civilians who've lost their lives since the war started. This is what's going on here. Where our president is lying, and this vicious dictator was telling the truth. And after a while, you know, you have to take it personally. That when this kind of criminal violence in Iraq is conducted in our name, the name of the American people, and you know how many times Bush wraps the American people around them, and how many times he wraps the soldiers around them. Although he'll never go to Dover, Delaware to see them returning deceased. We have to do something about it. Because people, Americans are going all over the world and they're afraid to go to a lot of countries now. Our reputation is at stake. Our potential is at stake. We spend so much money on pr preparing and, and building death-dealing weapons and yet we have so much more to give to the world, whether it's infectious disease research, whether it's clean water, all the things that the UN Development Program said would save millions of lives for a pittance of what we're spending now in Iraq. So we need to take heart here. This is not kind of a will-o'-the-wisp effort around the country. There are tremendous assets that we have to end that war and end that occupation. But we've got to rev it up, focus it, and spread it. And, and that means we all have to talk it up in our own little circle, our own epicenter of friends, relatives, and workers.